Alpha Team report. What's happening, Heather? Alpha Team has been responding. Bravo? Still nothing. You lost both teams? Get a grip on this operation, Heather. That's bored. Read like the asset. Sir, I need more time. We have no time. Are you going to give that order or not? Sir, please. You are too naive to see the truth. There's no bringing in born. He will defend these police officers. Listen to police officers' commands, listen to what we tell you, and just stop. The nation needs to realize that when we tell you to do something, do it. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. If you're right, then the courts will figure it out. We don't get to take the enforcement. And at the end of the day, each and every man is go home safe. Sometimes the use of force is necessary. You need to comply with the police officer the way the system was meant to be. Comply with the orders of police officers. Resisting arrest is a real and dangerous crime. Nonpartisan liberty for all. I'm your host, Dave Bourne, and it is January 25th, 2017. And we are coming to you live from Las Vegas, Nevada. Thank you for tuning in to Nonpartisan Liberty for All. We're on weeknights, Tuesday through Thursday, now at 6 o'clock Pacific, 9 o'clock Eastern, on the Nonpartisan Liberty for All media and radio network, which now runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And you can listen to the live stream on Spreaker.com and NonpartisanLibertyForAll.com and to the archives immediately following the show on Spreaker, YouTube, Twitter, Tumblr, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and iTunes. On Nonpartisan Liberty For All, we promote self-ownership and the ideas of true freedom and liberty, meaning being able to do whatever you want as long as you respect the freedom of others and don't directly interfere with their freedom. Exposing government for what it is, a mafia based on extortion that rules without consent by threat of force and violence. And we are always happy to hear from you. You can reach us via phone at 702-470-7664. That's 702-470-7664. Or you can reach us via Skype, username Nonpartisan Liberty for All. And if you forget any of that information, you can get it at Nonpartisan Liberty for All.com, along with links to all our social media, as well as original articles and blogs and other fun stuff. Uh, as it is Wednesday, or the second Wednesday since the last time he was here. We are joined by Ken Shorjan of The Daily Economist. Ken uh, has a website, uh, thedailyeconomist.com. He also has a YouTube channel where he does a podcast Monday, Wednesday, and sometimes Friday uh, at Ken Shorjan or search for the Daily Economist. All the links to uh, his stuff, including his YouTube channel, is in all of the archives if you uh, go into there and you're le- re listening to the show, especially being that m- majority of our listens come from people listening to the archives. So, uh, Ken, thanks for joining us as always. Yep, pleasure to be here. So, um, I was looking at the site and I know there's other things going on as well, but, uh, one of the things that really stands out is there's a lot of shit going on with gold. Um, a lot of stories are in different, uh, types of stories, um, going on, on gold. One that really stuck out, uh, especially because of, the new CIA director and uh, a I was thinking about a uh, editorial that he wrote how he one uh, states that uh, things were rolled back or some shit but uh, yeah 
like I believe that, and that he wants to take things even further and have some searchable database with your, uh, I forget how they worded it, but I have it posted on Facebook somewhere where I can look it up, but it, it was worded in a way like your, uh, a personal profile or some fucking shit. Anyway. Actually, actually, uh, that is specific for foreign non-citizens. The one that they're, they're doing is it's tied to immigration and it's going to be a database, um, with, uh, facial recognition, um, biometrics and, uh, complete dossiers of anybody who is a foreign national, uh, coming in and out of the country. Okay, and I believe that too. Um, in the, I didn't read the whole article, which I should. I have the excerpt from the article, but they could have, you know, took out whatever part of that. But it does talk about having profiles and things like that and going further in general. But I do know that. It has been, I have gotten the impression from the beginning that when it comes to things like spying and all of that stuff, that nothing's going anywhere or nothing's going to be reformed or that if, if anything, there's going to be more spying. There's going to be... Actually, if you, if you saw the speech that uh, Trump did just before his inauguration where he spoke uh, to the intelligence uh, officers... He laid a lot of uh, words between the um, between the lines well, that I... pretty much let them know that he's going to reassign a lot of the intelligence services to functionality. And one of them, he you know, he made reference to the pillars, as in, or I mean, columns, the columns, as in, he understands that the intelligence agency has been a fifth column against the people of the United States. Um, one of the things he wants to do with the CIA is he wants to separate the analysts from the operators, and all operators are going to to function outside the United States. He pretty much wants to downsize Langley. At least that's what he says. Well, but yeah, that's not I, the impression I got before, and that's the, not the, what the, he was this, saying. He's only been in office three before, days. Before, so we'll and, and, we'll see what right. happens, but. Right, and and being in office three days, the, it's always going to be not what you say, not the rhetoric. What do you it's do? What you do, right? And the other thing was, he said to the CIA, uh, they have a blank check. Um, when I was watching, I watched part of that speech, but I only caught like a small part of it. And I happened to catch the CIA has a blank check, and all of the positive things he was saying about the CIA, and then the article about the new CIA director. And the op-ed that he posted. This is not from Donald Trump, though. The the I'm talking about the op-ed that was posted by the new CIA director in, I believe, November or December. Um, Brennan or Pompeo? Pompeo. And he... That's the old CIA director. Right. Um, and what it said was... I'll, I'll actually bring it up real quick. It it um, and again, you can always manipulate an article and only you know pull out a paragraph and take it out of context. That's possible. Yeah, in, an, in an op-ed, but it's, it's uh, extremely uh, you know difficult unless you absolutely know the author. Um, and especially these days, what news site? You know, if it's not alternative media, then it all was alternative. It's media. all fake. It's all fake news. No, it was from. Um, let me see where the article was from, but it it was his own op ed, so I mean, oh, got it, it yeah, gotcha. You know what I'm saying? So they, mm-hmm. you can't really, <laughs> yeah, true. You can't really say, well, you know. So he, um, uh, what was the the link? Doesn't have it. It came from Drudge. Uh, I don't know if it was an original Drudge article, actually. Because I just have drudgetoday.com, but let me click on the actual article and see if there's a... Because they don't usually write... Um, okay, Associated Press was yeah, the Yeah, Dr- Drudge almost in. just links important... important oh, that, sorry, that, that wasn't um, that wasn't it. That was the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, how he, uh, he got rid of that. Um, gotcha. So... I have this somewhere though. Okay. 
Well, we can talk while I'm I'm looking for it, but it was an op-ed, and in the op-ed, it talked about you know taking more uh, more spying and you know going even further. And again, that possibly um, could be what just the the new director had posted but i you know if that's his direction i don't know why you would appoint him um if that's not your direction but again it wasn't what trump said it was what he said okay it was from the atlantic it it said uh from his op-ed this is just a paragraph again it could have been more to it but congress should pass a law reestablishing collection of all metadata it now, first of all, when did they stop? Um, you know, as far as I know, they never stopped anything, whether they say they did or not. And combining it with uh, publicly available financial and lifestyle information, that's what I was looking for. And a comprehensive searchable database, legal and bureaucratic impediments to surveillance should be removed. That includes policy presidential directive 28, which bestows privacy rights on foreigners and imposes burdensome requirements to justify data collection. So it does uh, mention foreigners when it comes to that. But um, I don't think I don't believe they stopped anything anyway. see, 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 you've got to separate the CIA by law. And we know that they is not they, supposed to operate in the U.S. Right. I know. It's the NSA, right? Now that has the collection on everybody in the United States, right, and, right, and all that. So, um, you know, by by saying that, I, this is this is one of the things that I believe is tied to, um, the illegal illegal aliens. You know, Trump's uh, you know battle to to deal with that, a combination of uh, the attacks by. You know, and here's another thing that's really that's really um, stands out is because Trump was was moved a lot by Europe when they opened the floodgates to all the refugees, and you saw the crime and the and the two false flags that have occurred since that happened and the whole nine yards. So that's one of the big big sticklers because he he did an executive order banning refugees from seven different places. All of them, pretty much the ones that Europe let in. He did that yesterday. Yeah, I had actually a long time ago before I really thought about, you know, when I was, I I was always at least like a libertarian. But when, you know, thinking about immigration years and years ago, I had thought, well, why don't they just say if a country sponsors terrorism, don't let anybody in from that specific country. But... (laughs) Ironically, uh, there was a president who did. Guess who? Jimmy Carter. Yeah, there you go. He he banned anybody from Iran coming in, and that's what that's a, the big joke is is that the uh, liberals went all ape on Donald Trump when he was saying you know ban Muslims and ban from the terrorists, right? And yet their own guy did it back in 1979. Yeah, I don't necessarily agree with uh, that at this point because thinking about, you know, getting permission from government to uh, it's I, I don't want to get into a whole conversation on that. But um well it's, it, it's it a went, great question. It's a great question in this aspect though. Okay? Because libertarians will say we shouldn't have borders. But then again, look what happened when and that's kind of how I feel million but, refugees came into Europe. Here's the, here's the problem is that in the Western world and even bits of Latin America that are more Westernized um, versus third world countries, then you can get away with that and 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 the borders really you know don't mean too much. But the problem is is that Islam is is similar to the way the Catholic Church ran Europe during the Dark and Middle Ages. Okay. It was it was a virtual theocracy. The the kings were only there at the behest of the church, and they had to follow the church. And it led to two different inquisitions and the Reformation movement. That Islam in its current state is not compatible with the West. No, and I, see, I, I understand really, even though that in in theory or even in reality to an extent that I I don't believe in in borders and how 
uh, land is acquired in the first place is and that's a whole another issue but but i understand the two big things one is is welfare so fucking get rid of welfare and you're gonna have a lot less people trying to come over number one at least poor people um so that's a big thing that i don't believe in welfare so right. if you want to come over here, I believe you should be able to come over here, but you got to make it 100% on your own. But the other, the other thing that I, I realize why people make it an issue is that if you have enough people coming to your country that have different, a different belief system, you can totally change the country, which is what they're trying to do to an extent now. Right. And that, so that, I see the the point there um, when it comes to that. Um, so but as far as a lot of these things, they're still going to affect freedom negatively. I mean, you already have it now where you have checkpoints in the U.S. And that's a total violation of people's rights. You can't I mean, they can do whatever they want and they do. But. Really, if you're actually following the Constitution, you can't just have a fucking checkpoint 100 miles away from the fucking border, which is pointless anyway, because all they do is ask you, are you a U.S. citizen? As long as you say, yeah, I mean, what the fuck? Right. You know, and, and, and you, you don't even have to answer their questions. And, and what's the point of having a border anyway if uh, states like California... Are just gonna let them let them in anyway. Well, that's a whole nother issue. But I, my, my my point is that when you ramp up on the searching for illegal air aliens, you're gonna end up violating uh, people's rights that are U.S. citizens because you're gonna increase the police state no matter how you look at it. Now, you may not want to do that. That might not be your intention. Um, but it's going to happen. It's just, it's just a given that if you ramp up the, uh, immigration, um, or not ramp up immigration, but, uh, as far as immigration policing, that you're going to affect, uh, normal people's rights. It's just like in Arizona where they, uh, I don't think the law went through or it only did for a little while. You would know more cause you live there that, you, it's something about having to prove that you're a citizen, but what what could happen is people that are citizens can end up getting pulled over, and you know right. their rights the, get violated, and they the have law, to show their papers. The law in Arizona was if you get pulled over, not it it wasn't supposed to be um, pulled over just for the hell of it. Yeah, but, but cops can get, get around over. that shit easily, well, yeah, and they but, do. But it's not necessarily the cops; it's people. Some people are you know it's like it's like if you take a look at some of the uh the people in the police force now you know the stereotype about the the big buffed white guy with the bald head you can tell in a new york minute that that dude is roiding out he's steroids and steroids are gonna you know put an anger and violent streak in you and, and boom and there's a lot of individuals who are in police forces now that take steroids well they hire uh, i told you the guy that arrested me who's on a bunch of videos of Las Vegas police on YouTube if you want to see him. He's a blonde-headed guy. Can't miss him, but he's a former MMA fighter. Why would you hire a former MMA fighter for the police? Um, yeah. it, why? I mean, nothing against MMA guys, but they beat the fucking shit out of people for a living. Why would you hire them? So I don't want to get in a big discussion about the police. You know how I feel about them. But... Um, you know, that's kind of what they want. And it seems like from what I've heard uh, regarding police that, you know, all I hear out of Trump's mouth is whatever the police want and there's no problem with the police. And I don't hear anything about anything positive regarding um, the police violating people's rights. And I'm talking about everybody's rights. Uh, and I'm not just talking about killing people. I'm talking oh, right. about violation of rights. And see, and and see a, big, a big problem is is that uh, in this case especially, okay, Trump was affected by the activist groups that were funded by George Soros, a.k.a. Black Lives Matter. Uh, the amount of protest and activism that took place during the, during the election. When he came to Arizona, 
Right, he that's could, how they ruined fucking, uh, I mean, Black Lives Matter, along with the people on the other side that fought back and forth with them. And and I, I said this to you off air, I believe, that they making it totally about race got the conversation totally off the fact that the police are too militarized and all of these uh, things that people were talking about. Right. And see, the thing about it is with a lot of people, you know, some of the onerous laws that are passed, at, even at the local level, it's not because there's an epidemic that needs a law passed. What ends up happening is is that somebody who's got a little bit of, uh, you know, either money or power or authority, something happens to them. You know, like, uh, say... Uh, Her- so well, this is what's going to go on with heroin and opium, and this is uh, Trump has talked about that as well. Right, but I'm talking about, say, somebody somebody has a house and, and some neighbor, you know, college kids go in, blare up the music, and so, uh, you know, that rich person who's got a nice house, he's going to go to the legislature, the mayor, he's going to scream, I want a law, well, and the law gets passed because right, of right. one person. But I was going to talk about, like, opium, like somebody's rich kid OD'd or something. Oh, but yeah, they, they, that's they, because well, mad. They're Same making, they're calling it an ep- epidemic. If you actually look at the data from doctors that have studied it, which is very few and are honest about it, uh, Dr. Carl Hart, I did a show on him, who actually has studied drugs for 25 years, and it's all prop- a lot of it's propaganda. Not to say that they're good, but certain things are good for it can help you. And a lot of drugs are uh, just basically just a tiny bit different than prescription drugs. The problem is that, you know, you're getting street chemists to also put other shit in it and and that fucks it all up. But it's not an ep- epidemic. It's fucking it's only like 6% of the population as a whole even uses drugs on a regular basis, okay? So when it comes to heroin, then you cut that down to like 2, I believe. And I'm sorry, it's not a fucking ep- epidemic. But no, Trump but has ep- talked about fucking heroin and, and it being an epidemic. And that's another thing. So I, I, I don't want to get into a whole big Trump conversation, but there's a lot of things when it comes to Trump that are anti-freedom. And I've always said this. Oh, sure. And, and uh, I have serious uh, uh, concerns with that. But at the same time, you know, it doesn't matter who's president, I don't think, because they're going to do things to take away freedoms. And the baton gets passed to Trump now, and he might do things that people think are positive, like create jobs or get rid of the TPP. But the plan to take more control and the government to take more control, I believe, is still going to happen, whether Trump's in there or Clinton's in there or whoever. And Trump is a guy who says a lot of things and then changes and says a different thing. And... He is a businessman, which he brings up all the time and makes deals and all of these different things. So um, I don't think there's going to be any difference. I know I I heard he's putting all this money into infrastructure as well. Um, Somebody said a trillion dollars. I I didn't hear uh, uh, all the details. It's probably going to be he wants a trillion dollars over four years. Yeah, uh, that's crazy. 135.7 135.7 billion well if you remember um uh congress gave uh 900 billion to uh obama for those quote-unquote shovel well, that's jobs. crazy too that's the problem is it, the problem is is that none of that money went to the shovel ready jobs that money went funneled into uh campaign contributors and and you know a whole bunch of garbage um yeah the the thing about it is is with uh the infrastructure is take a look at china China, as the as the global economy slowed down, China realized that if they had all these unemployed people, there'd be another revolution. They'd have to, you know, somebody I was listening to in an interview the other day said, in a good year, in a good year, there are over seventy five thousand riots and protests, and a hundred thousand people, both cops and civilians, will get killed in a good year in China. Okay, now. China, well, of course, has you got to remember they also have a, what a billion people, even yeah. though that's probably still a high percentage. But right, but if you take a look at the U.S., even with our twenty-four hour media, we don't have seventy-five thousand protests or even twenty-five thousand protests in a year, which is we're about the third of a size. No, of China. no. But that being that being aside, they have to keep them employed. Okay, that's you know 
with here in the states, welfare well, the, keeps the, other the people reason docile. Is, the the other reason is China's a, a communist country too, and they don't communist get all the shit that they get here. Capital, I, I know, I know, but they still economically. They don't have an illusion of freedom over there. I wouldn't no. think. You know, they don't have they the have same. Here. They don't have the same freedoms. But here's the interesting thing: it's like in Russia. If you take a look at the history of Russia, um, Russian people, when they've been given a chance for freedom, they've actually demanded that the strong men come back and rule them. Ivan the Terrible left. He he uh, he abandoned ship as head of uh, of Russia. And the, the the people came or started getting a few freedoms, and they started going back to tribal warfare and fighting each other. And so they begged Ivan to come back. And when Ivan came back, he, of course, you know, was already mentally insane, and the terrible took over. But in Russia, they demand a strong man. Now, they'll, they'll complain about it, but whenever they have a weak leader like Boris Yeltsin, oh, they just the whole place well, goes I, to hell. I, I think now, of course, after the you know, since the early 1900s and uh, what the Bolshevik whole revolution or whatever, that they've been you know, it's like somebody that's been in prison and then they for 20, 30 years and they get out and like in a way they want to go back to prison. You know the thing. The thing that uh, with the Soviet Union, when the Soviet Union fell, what ended up happening is you had a whole generations of young people who all they knew was what the Communist Party told them to do. They couldn't think for themselves. There was no right. such thing as entrepreneurship, and that's why the 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 mafia, you know, the Ukrainian mafia, and, and that that they took over uh, the the thieves and crooks. And the people, you had a lot of men who, you know, just didn't know what to do themselves because there were no jobs. They didn't know how to fend for themselves. So they either just drank themselves to death or they committed suicide. At, you know, within a decade after the Soviet Union fell in the early 2000s, both in Ukraine and in Russia, the um, disparity, the number of women to men was about 11 or 10 or 12 women for every man. That's that's some pretty good odds. Yeah, it is. I guess uh, you know the ugly guys but, can get some good looking girls. But the other side of the coin is, is if you take a look at uh, Russia's economy today, it's not obviously not as big as the United States. But when Putin took over, the economy was 151 billion dollars GDP per year. Now it's 1.5 trillion. The amount of money that is uh, that they gave for the pensioners went up from something like uh, 5,500 rubles to 75,000 rubles a month. The, uh, they have virtually no debt. They have 30, 000, 20 to 30,000 tons of gold stored up. They're now the biggest distributor of oil in the world, you know, and the, and the ruble's getting stronger and a lot of investment when it comes in. This is all because of one man who just wrenched them out of that thing. Well, the problem with the United States, of course, is, is that our whole empire is built on being able to have the reserve currency and forcing everybody else to use the dollar. And the way we did that was, of course, using war. Well, it's an interesting thing. Uh, the Davos World Economic Forum, that annual place, you know, where the elites go to get $40 hot dogs and talk about how they're going to rule the world for another year, yeah. all the bankers and rich. Well, Jack Ma, um, if you know who he is, he's – the CEO of Alibaba, you know, the China's version of Amazon, online retailer. Well, Jack Ma spoke at Davos, and one of the things he said was, is, um, you know, the United States cannot really blame NAFTA and, and uh, all these trade deals where everything got offshored. Because over the past, he said, over the past 30 years, the United States has spent $14 trillion in war. And that's why they're broke. That's why they're bankrupt. Well, that's and that's why, why they, that's why no they went off the gold standard in the, to begin with, right? Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, it, they, they went off the gold standard after France demanded gold and didn't want the dollar. But the reason that France got that is because the U.S. had to expand the money supply to feed the military industrial complex right. so they could go to Vietnam, right? Exactly, yeah. And see, this is where this is where gold is going to be so significant because uh, if Trump 
believes what he was saying during the uh, the election that or the campaign, where we have these bubbles, the economy is going to crash, it's going to collapse. You know, we've got too much debt. If he believes what he's saying versus just rhetoric, then I think he knows during his administration that the dollar is going to crash, it's going to collapse, it's going to lose its reserve currency status, the stock market's going to crash, the whole nine thing. You know, and so is he putting trying to rush through things now, putting in to prepare for the collapse. Either way, China is already preparing for the collapse. They're, um, we'll get back to the CIA, what they said about the gold manipulation, but since I'm doing a segue, let me uh, find what uh, China recently said about gold and oil. Du -du -du, du -du -du. I got a number of these things up here. Uh, Well-respected fund manager, John Hathaway of Tocqueville Gold Fund. He's been in, in Wall Street since 1970. He said that uh, China this year, this year, 2017, China looking to dominate the world oil trade through a gold-backed yuan, i.e. replace the petrodollar system with a gold-backed yuan, the yuan petro system. The second thing is, is they are preparing to radically reprice gold higher when the COMEX and London Gold Fix uh, collapse, the paper markets. Yeah, but they, they've been looking to do do that for uh, a, a little while now, right? Well, been, we, we at least been talking about it for a little while, right. but, but the whole process had to get in place because I think when we originally started talking about it, it was before they had even set up their uh, gold, uh, whatever it's called, their gold, their, their, their gold version exchange. of, yeah, their version of the COMEX or right. whatever. And, and that's, the, that's the thing with China is, you know, here when, here in the U.S., it, the, the Western, we always want things now. We expect things, you know, if, if somebody comes up with some analysis, we expect it's going to happen tomorrow yep. or next week. Fucking corporations too, China man. creates five-year plans. They have patience. And, you know, the interesting thing is, is we're not talking the Mao five-year plans, but we're talking the one since the, the uh, cultural revolution that took place in the 70s. After Mao died, they changed things over and started moving, keeping the communist political side and moving to a capitalist uh, um, economic side. They started doing five-year plans. And the interesting thing is, is that when you take a look at the track record of their five-year plans, they fulfill them. Yeah, because Almost when when, fulfill them. when you have a plan and you're actually planning something out, you're doing it correctly so it gets fulfilled as opposed to, uh, you know, and I'm just talking in general, even when you're talking about, you know, working in your job or working for a corporation or whatever, that, you know, that is the attitude that people want things now and they'd rather have them fucked up and quickly than done right and take longer. That's a, that's kind of the corporate attitude for most of the companies I've worked for, to be honest. That they've they pretty much, I mean, they don't come out and say that, but it's almost like, well, if if we have a bunch of bugs, we'll just fix them later. Um, but they'd rather have something, you know, the the timing is and and getting something done quickly is more important than taking the time to get it done right. Oh yeah, when when you have, especially like if you're a software company, and you've yeah, got uh, a new software. That's almost out. exactly what I'm talking. Well, I'm, I was talking more about like implementing systems, but yeah, same type of thing. You know, right. they want it now, and it's yeah, it's software, same thing. It's like then you end up with all these bugs and new versions. I mean, like Microsoft when they came out with what was the one that was really fucked up, and they had to uh, you had to go back to the previous. I, I think it might have been Windows Vista. 8 or 7. No, no, I, 7. I think it was uh, – no, Windows 7 actually was really, really, really good. Vista. Was Vista, the one you're right, you're up. right, you're right. Windows 7, I think, was the one before Vista. So I think you had to go back from Vista to Windows 7 because Vista was so fucked up. Actually, actually, no, Windows 7 came out of Vista's failure, but the one you're thinking okay, of then the one before that. to is Windows XP. Oh, yeah, yeah. Vista was yep. replacement for Windows XP. Yep, no, you're right. I remember. Yeah, so it, that's an example of that exactly. And then Vista, I don't think they ever fixed it. They just, uh, 
Windows 7 ended up coming out of that, like you were just right. saying. So, yeah, I think the only long-term plan that the government – was patient enough is the t- basic takeover of the whole country and constitution and that whole thing that that's a generational thing that's been going on i think since the beginning but that's just my opinion but um even people that disagree with that would say it's been going on for no, at least a hundred years no if, if you go back to the to the uh original and and the especially just the, think of the colonists before they they went against king george and that in the 1600s there was a, a guy named sir francis bacon um he believed in atlantis frying things uh, no <laughs> sir francis sir francis bacon was uh was kevin a, bacon's uh, great yeah, <laughs> yeah uh but in in the history of the uh secret societies Sir Francis Bacon is one of the top, you know, Freemason, Illuminati, the whole nine yards. And he, when, when he, when the Europe was starting to colonize the new world, he foresaw the United States as being the new Atlantis. And that's why, if you take a look at a lot of the way that Washington DC is set up, including the Washington monument as an obelisk, the entire thing is set up on a, a Masonic grid. So a lot of the founding fathers, there's pictures of George Washington with his uh, nice fig, wig on. Fig leaf, no, his fig leaf apron. He was a, he was a Freemason. Uh, I haven't seen him. Uh, yeah, I know. I know he was a Freemason. Pubs. I know most of them were. Yeah. So they had in the intention of uh, of creating that as the um, the new Atlantis and use that as the means there you to go. take over the world. There you go. It, see, you know what? You know what's funny? When before I knew about Freemasons, I thought they were actual fucking Masons. I, I was like, they talk but about they, the Freemasons. I, I I thought they were like mace, like bricklayers. Ah, uh, I'll give you a quick quick history. I, you were, you told me this before, but right, they were. The, the, I forgot. The, but go ahead. The Masonic Order, the Freemasonry, actually came was originally using the the techniques of the egyptians when they built the pyramid yeah you had told me this when because I, I think i told you the same thing before that i thought they were actual masons but yeah, i thought the whole thing was like masons like literally what, what ended up happening is uh you know during the crusades the templars were created and the templars were originally t- supposed to um they were a special order of knights that were to protect the pilgrims that were traveling to the holy land and back from europe but the Templars were staying in the ruins of King Solomon's temple. And what they discovered was that they discovered all the secrets of Solomon and Solomon's wisdom. And it suddenly made them incredibly powerful. Uh, when they came back after the Crusades, they became the richest organization, even richer than kings and, and countries. And so the kings got together with the help of the pope. The pope outlawed the temple Templars. The the king of France went on a cru- you know, crusade to kill them all, Jacques de Marley, Marnay, and so the rest of them fled to uh, Scot, what is now Scotland, and they merged their organization. The Templars merged with the Freemasons, which was a Mason reunion, and they that's how that they took those secrets, and that's why Masonry right. is so steeped in rituals because these are the same uh, secrets that were from solomon's temple and then of course later on the the freemasons uh the yeah the freemasons merged with the illuminati and you know there you have that so but i had thought like the you know uh more recent masons before i knew about them were oh, you know yeah. that it had to do with masons or something no, I but like, i'll tell you what if you take a look at their but, architecture uh, they certainly know they certainly yeah. know masonry and there's a reason why there's a uh uh pyramid on the dollar bill yeah i was gonna bring up the the dollar that the uh with the eye and whatever now here's something interesting okay here's something interesting about the money i don't know if you've seen the new 100 hundred dollar bills when you say new it, it, i mean because there's been a new one are you talking about there's an even newer one or the one that like has like purple tint in it not the purple tint. There's a new one coming out. So there's out. a new, new one. Okay. No, I haven't s- seen that while, yet. While you're, while you're 
think about this. I need to find out when, if it's come out or if it's going to. But there's new symbolism. Um, there's new symbolism on the hundred dollar bill. Is there anything? I'm just waiting for them to put like an RFID or some kind of fucking thing in there that oh, they it, can. It's, uh, it's a new hundred dollar bill. But if you see on it, they actually have a uh, they have gold signified in there. And, you know, one of the 100. Um, like drawn on the bill? No, in the in the lower right, where it's, you know, in the four corners, they have 100, 100, 100, 100 for the denomination. Uh-huh. One of them's gold. They've got a gold uh, peacock feather and inkwell. And what. You this, mean gold colored? Yeah, gold colored. Okay. It's not real gold. Right, right. But what it's supposed to symbolize is, is that uh, at a certain point, they intend to go back to a gold backed currency. So what was the rationale behind it? Because, again, I'm, I'm waiting. I don't know if, and, and you actually had another article about this, and we've talked about it, about going you know, cashless. Do you, do you think that we'll end up cashless before they are able to track money? Because that's the other thing, like, like I was saying, that I, I think about that having – you know, with um, like nanotechnology and these tiny little things that they're going to be able to implant stuff in money that is so small that, I mean, there's so much money. I don't know how, well, databases are getting so big too, that it would be easy to probably track uh, money. Uh, I don't know if they have all the technology to do it now. Well, I, I mean, there's GPS. Su- I would not and- be surprised if that blue magnetic strip that's on the hundred dollar bill isn't an RFID chip that they can track it. Okay, that's uh, that's what I was saying. So, are you talking about the one that's already in there that you can take out, or yeah, because they're like even in a dollar bill, you can take out. There's like a thing inside it, and you can take it out. You can actually like cut it. I think it's in a dollar. I don't have any dollars. I only have twenties. But it, there was a, it's like a thing that's inside the the bill. You know, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. That you can yep. like a little strip. It's it's paper, I think, still in in the uh, bills now. But you can actually like open it up and take it out. But if it's a hundred and you do that, when people hold it up to the light, they'll say, well, it doesn't have the thing in it and they might think it's fake. So, um, yeah, see, yeah, I could see and, it in and, the 20 in reality. In reality, they sort of don't have to do that because right now they can track, uh, the database, every, every single bill that is made is put into a database and they can track the serial numbers. Yeah. They, they do have serial the numbers where right? they were done, the banks who took them out of the banks, where they were spent, things like that. So it takes a little bit longer, but, but yeah, was, but it, I mean, it gets passed around. So to track who has a bill, right? They can't do that. Is, is impossible right unless right. you had a GPS uh, tracker in it, and then you know, then you could track it. But I mean, true. But think about this also. Okay, the more that they create the technology, do these things, the more that technology comes out to counter it. Right, you right. You always have the anti-technology. It's like with the um, the uh, police radar scanner. Well, you know what? It didn't take too long for a jammer to come out. You could put on your dashboard and, and you know, do that. The right. thing about it is, is at a certain point, if you've got cash with an, a type of RFID on it, well, there are now wallets, just a regular wallet yeah, you can put your back that pocket. Will stop it. Negates the RFID. Yeah, they have shit with your phone, too, that will stop the... Uh... Uh, stop so they can't get into your phone of course you have things like um vpn uh, uh vpn and ip cloaking right um, which isn't that good you have tor a- and then you can also buy fucking uh you know track phones for like 10 bucks and then buy a card for like 20 and what they did uh and, and this is kind of fucked up but I found one that uh, doesn't actually do this. Most all the big email companies now, they make you give them a phone number that you have to validate. So essentially, the email has to text your phone and you have to go in to your text and validate that that's your phone. Right. So 
they can track almost all emails. However, I found an email that's totally anonymous. And then what you do is when you get a, tr a track phone, if you want to keep that phone anonymous, all you have to do is give an email. So you create an email. And if you really want to be totally so they can't track anything, of course, you buy it in cash. And then you go in through Tor. And then when you register the phone and the email address, you do it that way. And then, you know, you have a totally untraceable phone, which you why, know, why you even have to do that. I mean, it, but, it, but but you're you're assuming also that politicians and government are actually smart enough for this stuff. Let me give you an example. Well, Remember, I'm, I'm saying if you want to be pretty sure that unless you're somebody who they're actively seeking, you just blew something up. But I mean, if you're just a regular person and you want an untraceable phone, doing that will be more than enough. Right. Actually, even just having an anonymous email and having, um, you know, a, a track phone will be enough for most people. Because you know, they're, the, uh, they're not going to find out unless they're really looking into it. The the WikiLeaks where they had the Podesta emails. Yeah, yeah. I know, you know he used his fucking what? what Gmail what was his name or his email? Yeah, he, he it was so he stupid. Added, he put all that on a Gmail account. That, and he passed yeah, that password. wasn't even really a, a hacker. That was just somebody who figured out his easy. <laughs> It's so stupid, exactly. man. Uh, what I'm saying is, is that the the people who are the elites and in, are in morons. The, they're morons. Exactly. Podesta was the representative to the UN in that document, the 2015 one that talked about uh, the U.S. and rich countries giving all their money to poor countries to make everybody equal and make now, the whole remember, world two, government. Two Podestas. No, it they're, was him, John. They're, they're, John Podesta. Right. John Podesta and then his he brother's was, a big time lawyer and, and right. part of the No, I'm law. talking about John Podesta. He represented the US in that UN document. But um yeah, he's a fucking it's so stupid. Moron. Either that or it's arrogance that they think like Well, he lost all his intelligence drinking combination of blood and urine and and semen in his spirit cooking. <clears throat> that's yeah. literally what that is. That's that's what's sad about this. By the way, you know what I found really fascinating? Um, you know, somebody like Diane Feinstein. I've always seen her as a liberal feminist hack who who I see her know, as an old witch, like probably yeah. a real one. Interesting she did this when uh she was on the the panel that was uh grilling Jeff Sessions who's uh, going for attorney general. You know what the first question that she asked Jeff Sessions is? She said, now, can, I, can we be sure that you go after the biggest uh, criminal uh, activity that's taking place right now? And I'm talking about pedophilia. <laughs> I was just like, I dropped to the floor because that's exactly what this whole – Hillary Clinton, John Podesta, right? Thing the 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 pedophilia and that that cart thing is so prevalent worldwide. You know when when they when it, the uh, earthquake hit Haiti, and uh, you remember there was that uh, donate fund with uh, George Bush Senior and Bill Clinton. You know uh, whatever that money yep. went directly into the uh, into the Clinton Foundation. Two billion dollars. Well, here's something else that happened. There were a lot of children who went missing in Haiti, and they arrested a woman who was part of the Clinton Foundation. They threw her in jail for 14 years for child trafficking. So, so assuming that uh, this child trafficking, this pedophilia, this sac yeah. you know, child sacrifice, this for Diane Feinstein to mention that. That's like, oh, my God, because this is going to be one of the biggest things. If they start investigating that, the whole frickin' cartel, the whole establishment is just going to be blown wide open. And you got to wonder about these, you know, the snowflakes and that and the, the this women's march that was going on where they don't even know what they were. Uh, uh, I, I was talking about for. yesterday. Um, I, I talked more about the one that took place during the inauguration, 
which the shit that people were saying it, it was it's all socialists and communist shit and um basically I, I, it's like it's 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 a uh, you take that together with black lives matter and what they posted as their agenda it's the exact same thing I, I I put it to my analogy was what the CIA does when they take over other countries. It seems like a whole big planned fucking thing to promote those ideas uh, and to. Well, sure. But who's who is the procurer and the funder of the color revolutions? Well, they all George, say George Soros, Soros, but it it, there's more than it's, the, that. I that mean, women, he can't be funding everything. There's other oh, people oh, oh. that are involved. You know, the, the, there are 1,300 NGOs in the United States, uh, uh, charitable 503C, 503C3s, 1,300 that are funded by Soros. It found out that the, it came out that the Women's March, you know, where 500,000 or 2 million women went to Washington, all that. 50 of the 52 of the organizations that were part of that march were have come out it's been proven they're funded by Soros and get this one of the top organizers one of the top organizers has ties to Hamas and yeah, she was heard out you, there uh, talking about demanding talking about that. that America become into Sharia law yeah you had the in the whole hijab thing that uh fucking bunch of women that were wearing those and and to me i think that's disrespectful to women i, I don't know why you whatever um well no think about this women are demanding these right you know what and if you ask them what rights that that trump or the republicans were going to take away they're from demanding the women, positive they rights they couldn't take anything they couldn't the, say the, no the, the there's there is one thing the only issue that um oh, is abor- abortion their, um pay for their abortion and there is an in issue their, it's uh, not about no it's not about paying for it it's about uh Make, trying to reverse uh, Roe versus Wade, but besides that, it's 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 not about that. It's about socialism. It's about uh, all the positive rights. It's about redistribution of wealth. I mean, they talk about freedom like it's you know I want to be free to have a living wage. I want to be free to have health care. I mean, yeah, it's even, all things even, that are not even freedoms. That, even that you said earlier. And you hit it on the head. You know what they? You know what they're afraid of? They're afraid of losing all the free stuff. They're afraid that since the liberals and the Democrats aren't in power, that they're going to suddenly not get their welfare for life. They're not going to get their free health care for life. They're not going to get their free education for life. They're not going to get all the yeah. Free but stuff. they're not the ones running this shit, as 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 you established that. It, all of these groups, and, and and it's just it's almost common sense now that any group that gets that big is being funded by somebody else. That's just exactly. a given. Like like the other the other one that said all the same shit the woman's uh, one did. It was called ah uh, fuck I I can find out um, I have it written down, but it was like an acronym, right? So they they actually protested right down the street. I talked about this yesterday, and I played a clip from it of a uh, white. Pakistani woman, um, which was very strange, and she was wearing one of those things, and she looked and sounded uh, American to me, and talked about white privilege and all this bullshit. Um, it's all the same shit, but the whole thing was on C-SPAN, and they said, "Oh, we're not funded by anybody," and whatever. Don't tell me that C-SPAN, and I know C-SPAN's not the biggest network, but it's still every cable company has C-SPAN. They they just it's a channel that they have. They well, all have like PB, fucking it's C-SPAN. Like PBS. Yeah, PB, they it's all, like PBS because the government uh, pretty much subsidizes it. it. Yeah. yeah, so they, they all have C-SPAN. So you're going to tell me that they're going to give you uh, five hours on C-SPAN and that fucking no one's funding you? Get the fuck out of here. And it's all the same shit, whether it's Black no. Lives Matter, whether it's them, whether it's the woman's thing. It's all uh, it's socialism. It's all bringing... You know, in the politically correct bullshit. And it's all the same big agenda to uh, all the shit that the progressives want to bring in and take away people's rights and convince people that positive rights are freedoms as opposed to, you know, which basically are the opposite because you're forcing people to to 
do something for you. You're forcing somebody to pay you or you're forcing somebody to perform a medical procedure or you're forcing to some somebody to do something. So See, it's all this is, bullshit. You, just, you hit the nail on the head. The Constitution doesn't promise you a life or the – Well, it's know, not just it about the Constitution as far as no, I'm concerned. It, the it, there's natural rights that you're, you're right. born with. But – Natural rights, natural law, and none of them has to do law. it right. They, none of them have to do with you being owed anything. They have right. to do with the right. They have nothing to do with other people. They have the to pre- do with yourself. The premise behind the Constitution in its original state of form, okay. People misquote it. They say life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. No, that's the Declaration of Independence. Right. That's the Constitution. The Constitution is supposed to provide equal rights under the law to give you the opportunity exactly. to succeed. It doesn't guarantee that you that they have to make you succeed. No, and you're not owed anything. And, and even going back to natural rights, your natural rights are about self-ownership and being able to, as you said, you know, being able to do what you want to create your own opportunities. Just being remember, able just to... Remember in- in in the natural rights, another another name for that is the law of the jungle. And survival of the fittest is part of the law of the jungle. Well, if you don't hunt, true. if you don't plant, you don't eat. Right. So you know? it, it, it's when you come down to it, it's about, you know, to me, it's all about self-ownership. And as long as you don't violate somebody else's rights, then you can do whatever you want. But yeah. right away... If you're saying that you're owed something, you're saying that you're you're violating somebody else's rights because you're saying, "Hey, you, I I'm born with the right that you owe me something." You're not born owed anything. You know, except maybe your parents to take care of you as a baby and even that there's debates on by uh what's his name? Um the famous fucking or the big uh libertarian who had an argument about you really don't have a uh, obligation to take care of your kids or something um oh my god what's his name uh roth i think it was rothbard it's argument um one of those oh, guys uh possibly. but uh, but anyway, uh, yeah. anyway rothbard, rothbard you know he was the one who almost like created the libertarian movement yeah i think it was him who uh actually had i mean he he had a logical argument but but that aside you nobody owes you anything you are not owed anything however you do i think in my opinion by being born you are born with these rights to be able to go out and make whatever life you want for yourself as long as you don't violate the rights of another person in the process like yeah. you can't go punch you somebody right and life. rob them to get Liberty your yeah and the pursuit of happiness now pursuit is exactly what well, you're saying I, I, pursuit is if you want to do something in life and be successful you right. have to do it nobody's going to give it to you nobody's well you also you. you you have the right to do what you want with your own body again as long as you don't hurt somebody else in the process of doing what you That's, want with your own body be, is kicking be somebody in the face yeah. then you know but you have the right to put what you want in your body you have the right to um you know all the all of those things that are illegal. I you know there is bullshit to me because you know, if you want to sell you know, your you know what's body, interesting is the uh, interesting thing about it is okay something you got to take in consideration. Um, taking drugs and 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 you know if you're in a community and there's people taking drugs or you know somebody taking drugs, taking drugs except if you're a moralistic like uh, the suffer you know the you know in the 1900s the the women who. Um, just went absolutely wild and got prohibition in because they were tired of their husbands being drunk and beating them. Uh, the same thing with drugs, you know, unless you're somebody moralistic and you uh, scream to the authorities or whatever, the, taking drugs and, and that in a community is not, not necessarily what drives it over the edge. The problem is, is that there's certain individuals who take those drugs that they cannot control themselves. And they go on and commit crime commit crimes well alcohol is uh probably the biggest alcohol, one yeah. that affects exactly. people in that way and in most people and most even doctors have not studied drugs and again i i 
uh, recommend that people check out Dr. Carl Hart, who's done 25 years of studies on drugs and talks about how even the how they talk about how bad all these drugs are for you, that that's all propaganda. It's not even close to how, how bad they are. You know, meth is basically Adderall. Um, and what happens, I think why they're worse for you when you buy them on the street is because you don't know what they put in them. And that's the problem. Um, well, yeah. not but, the but, drug itself, but like Adderall. Okay. Adderall is not pure speed. Adderall has buffers in there, inhibitors, so that you don't go absolutely Depends insane. on the, on the type of okay. uh, Adder- Adderall. It's just like you have um, time-released painkillers and you have non-time-released painkillers. Right, but at um, least those have some buffers. But, so but it's also, street, you can manipulate The stuff on the street is like, straight and you're right a lot of it is is jacked it's how you right right that's the biggest problem and and also people can you can take adderall um and i'm sure cut it up and i've heard people like snorting it and shit like that too so i I mean it's not they're not as bad it's more about how you use them and it's also and this is the fault of the government that when you buy it on the street yeah you could be getting something that Although, if you got what you thought you were getting, it's very close to Adderall. But because they put a bunch of shit in it, it's all fucked up. So that's, um, you know, the biggest difference there. But as far as the makeup and the the molecules and stuff like that, and same with um, what was the other drug that was really uh, close? Oh, heroin and morphine are basically the same thing. Um, yeah. but same yeah, thing with, with, uh, heroin, you don't know exactly what you're getting. Everybody's cutting it with something. Some people are putting like fentanyl in there too. Some people. So it, the, this thing that like, you're going to try drugs once and be addicted or, uh, you know, the, how bad they say it's for, it is for you. It's. It totally exaggerated. Not to say they're good for you. I'm well, not there saying was, that. There was one. Dr- but... There was one drug that for 80 percent of the people who took it, they were instantly addicted, and that was crack cocaine. They that is that is not true. Yeah, the, the that the is not statistics true. of the people with statistics crack, based on what yeah, statistics have... on. Statistics on they took a lab experiment of somebody who had never taken it in his life. I'd have to see the, the experiment because I yeah. take the the guy who's done 25 years worth of experiments and continues to experiment and comes out and tells the truth about this shit. And he doesn't want people, you know, using drugs when, uh, and dying from using them and getting addicted. Basically same thing. No drug you do once you get addicted, not the right. crack and crack and cocaine are the same thing. No, no. They crack are is yes, a they, different type of process no, that it, affects the brain chemistry. They are basically if you look at the chemistry again and I I would take his word no offense over yours him That's being fine. a doctor uh, a neuroscientist who's been studying it for 25 years. There is a slight difference. Um but for the most part it's pretty much the same. So if you're talking about, I, I know what you're talking about. There, there is a slight difference, and they cook it up with yeah. different shit. Well, but and, and it's it's looking looking. It's look pretty the much 80s, the same. The so, 80s crack was an epidemic. Cocaine was you not know, an epidemic you know why? in the 70s because crack is a lot cheaper. They gave you smaller doses, and they mixed it with a lot of other shit like baking soda. That's why. So again, I I, I go check him out because. That is something that, um, and not just because of my knowledge of drugs, because of him. I knew a lot of people that have done drugs. But, I mean, you know, from all his studies as well, it's they are basically the same thing. The ec- epidemic was more that it was a lot cheaper to buy. Uh, it was the poor man's cocaine is what it was. Right. And that's that's why. And it would only get you high for like five. I, I did a paper on it in fucking psychology. It don't, would only get you high for like five minutes. So people keep coming back, you know, to buy that ten dollar bag or twenty dollar. Probably then it was ten bucks, you know, for a little fucking rock. And that's why. And I don't even know that it was an epidemic because, you know, the word epidemic is 
has to be in relation to the to the population. It could have been yeah, but, an epidemic ep- in certain epidemic, areas. Epidemic but, means a combination of several things. One, the amount of people who are affected by it, i.e. addicted to it. Two, uh, to me, it's got to be percentage, the percentage of people, not amount of people. Because if you have so many people, you know, it's like it's got to be percentage. Because the it, rise, see, the thing about it is, is the epidemic includes many different social things. Okay, the rise of the Bloods and Crips in California came from from that crack war. The amount of people who were going yeah, into but they were around before that. overdoses Way were before because that. of that. The amount of crime that was being done to support the drug habits expanded immensely because of that. That's what I mean by the epidemic. Well, it affected the social fabric mm, of an entire community, if not state and I country. would say in certain parts of L.A. it was an epidemic. I would not say in New York – in certain parts, no, New York, um, New York did heroin things. was more uh, an epidemic in like yeah. Harlem and stuff like that. I would say, it's like in the country Sanders. as a whole, I would say no way. Bernie, that, Bernie Sanders, he's from where? Is he from New Hampshire or Vermont? Vermont, Vermont. Yeah, one of the things on when he was on the campaign trail was he was going absolutely ape talking about the epidemic of heroin that yeah, has and it's, blown up ever it's, since the uh, Afghan war. When the CIA started pumping I, I, in. I, I know all about the fucking calling heroin, and I'm going to do a video on it, it, saying that there's an epidemic of people using heroin and they're blaming it on doctors and painkillers and all of that. I, I know a lot about that. I fucking watched, I don't know how many goddamn documentaries on it from totally different perspectives, mostly the perspective of it's an epidemic. Um, and not the other side, but it's not an epidemic. There's not enough people, you know, maybe in one or two communities, because you could say if in this community you have so many people doing it, but what it is, is a lot of propaganda. Now I'm not saying that the users haven't gone up because they have, but it's not what they say it is. It can't be because if you only have, 6% or so of the population in the United States that are habitual drug users, it can't be. And and the other thing is, that's a myth, is that you can't be a drug user and not be an addict. You can't use drugs on a regular basis without being an addict and having problems and all of this bullshit. The only problems that a lot of people have, and again, this is a government-created problem, is money the fear of getting arrested and being able to get it. I don't consider that having a problem with it. I consider that government. I, you know, the thing about it is let's take a look at prohibition. Prohibition came and it failed. Um, Yeah. Because people were addicted to alcohol. They couldn't suddenly just stop doing it. There were there was the underground, and then of course it led to the crime of the alcohol. Alcohol and all, is and all the that. only drug that you can die from withdrawal. None of these other drugs can you die from withdrawal. It's a fact. Now, luckily, to get that addicted to alcohol to that extent, it takes you a while. Because yes. if it didn't. There'd be a lot of people fucking dying from alcohol. I, I want to throw I want to throw one thing at you, okay? The problem is is that genetics and a lot of makeup, okay? Drugs affect different people differently. The ones you were talking about, you know, who could just take drugs and be mellow and whatever and don't get affected. That's, that's one the segment. norm. That that's but, the norm. The people what, that can't is the minority. Well, yeah, but it's not that. One of the things that the that the white man did to pretty much beat down the uh, the Native Americans when we were colonizing the country, is they started giving them alcohol. Well, the problem is is that the Native Americans had well, they had peyote. Much a, well, they but they had a pretty much a diet that never had any sugar in it, and so their genetics and their DNA over generations, they had they were sugar, which is what alcohol pretty much is, and it's you know like basic fermented, form. yeah, yeah. But, you know, whether it's corn, which is, you know, corn sugar, uh, but it's sugar. Which is supposed and that to be the worst for you. 
the Na- pretty much all Native Americans across the board because for you know for centuries and that their diet had had no sugar in it and their genetics had made up that they were it was an anathema and that's why you know the stereotype about the alcoholic uh, Indians that was absolutely true because they genetically could not take alcohol now peyote is a different thing and here's something else all it's like all- acid all plants, all plants, and 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 all that that make up the drugs, whether it's uh, you know hemp and, and yeah, that's the other thing too uh, that the majority you, of these if, drugs come from plants. If you take that in in its natural form without any processing, that's not going to harm you a bit. The problem is, well, is that the depends on what you're talking drugs, about. The people who want to take these drugs, you know, it's like poppy seeds. That's not that's not if true you, though if, with the the. Take, yeah, poppy take, seeds, but that's not true with the the sap that comes out of the opium poppy. That, that's that's right. that's going to get but, you high. You need right. a lot of it, but because that's it's, what contains it, that contains morphine, codeine, thebine, and some other thing. And what they do is they extract those chemicals out of the poppy, and then they superimpose them to a much greater thing. And that's what they do. The processing is what makes drugs bad. If people just well, it depends how you thing. process it. I, you know, if, if you took the sap, I don't think drugs are like in a bong like they did in China during the opium days. If they didn't process it that much and just in a bomb, yeah, and it's, just it's still going to get opium, it's going to yeah, get you gonna, high. It's going to get you high, but it's not going to have the absolute detrimental effects. But, but pretty it, much when it, they it, process it, heroin into things beyond more you know you can get addicted to morphine you can get addicted to oxycodone you can get addicted to all these things that are opium based you know opioids because it's the processing that puts in all these things that attack the brain chemistry and make it you know really bad it doesn't make well just saying well you're addicted to it so that's bad I'm you know not what? saying being addicted to something is good, no. but that doesn't. I was one of the original, you know, if it does I damage, original, I was ahead. one of the original Ritalin kids, and they, you know, they did a study over 25 years, and and the kids who were on Ritalin, even if they got off of it when they were young or whatever, 95 percent of them were addicted to some type of drug, either alcohol, hard drugs, tobacco, cigarettes, well, something. When they became adults, first, they first of all, that kept yeah, chemistry. because they were they they might have been fucked up in the first place, or they got fucked up off of Ritalin. But when it comes down to it, now this isn't everybody. The majority of people that are the hardcore addicts, drugs are not the problem. The problem is they start using drugs because they're dealing with some other issue. Um, I'm talking about the hardcore, you know, addicts. Right. And usually that's why. But not all drugs are bad, and all the shit that p- they've been telling you about drugs, the majority of it is not true. Now, that doesn't mean that a drug you should go out and start doing drugs and they're good for you. I'm not saying that. I'm saying they can be helpful. A lot of drugs can be helpful for certain things. Fucking cocaine is used uh, in the dentist's office to, you know, uh, Novocaine. What do you think the cane came from? Oh yeah, so, yeah. I, I mean, if it's if, if it became public and they and they they legalize them, okay, they all should be legalized. But they should be legalized, but they should also be regulated. I up don't to believe a they point. should be regulated. Period. You, because... you know what? There's a reason that they have heroin overdoses. Okay. Do, do you common, know that the, the majority common per, right the common person is not they are mixing reason. drugs? That yeah, is but, one of the biggest reasons why they have heroin overdoses. First of all. Like yeah, Philip Seymour Hoffman, do, how, do, how do you think he dry, he died just from from heroin? Oh, I'm sure he died from a bunch no. Of other drugs. He died from like five other fucking drugs. Uh, same with Heath Ledger. Same with a lot of these people. Okay, and people do things that you can't control. First of all, whether they're legal or not, you can get them and do the same fucking thing. The difference is you and I don't I've done shows on drugs and I I don't want to rehash a whole fucking thing on drugs. But you take all of that shit out of it. You you don't get you don't have to worry about meeting a person to get drugs. You don't have to worry about what you're getting in them. You don't have fucking cartels killing people over drugs in alcohol. All you got to do is look at alcohol and 
treat it the same way as fucking alcohol. <laughs> and actually, before 1914 was the first year, uh, that that's when heroin, they started going after heroin and other drugs came after. They There wasn't a problem with it. The reason why they started banning fucking drugs was because of, oh, well, it, it was actually all racial. It was fucking... If heroin's legal, uh, I think heroin was the Chinese or something that the Asians in San Francisco, they had a law uh, about heroin and opium because they didn't want them giving it to white women and raping them. I mean, and that that's fucking the, the truth and the basis oh, behind it. And, yeah, and the same with, uh, you know, marijuana, the same yeah, thing. Was was black the people of, were no, marijuana, marijuana was the drug of the Latinos. And it was the Zoot Suit era of the 30s and 40s that uh, J. Edgar Hoover, um, you know, went absolutely ape over. And uh, he said, you know, he started those PSAs about, uh, you know, you don't want to be a Zoot Suiter and a, and a pot smoker like the Latinos. That was that was the thing that they started and on PSAs. <laughs> well, one thing, just real quick, and then we'll take a break, that, that people can't argue is that you have just the same way you have the mil- military industrial complex you have the whatever you want to call it when it comes to drugs you have a you have a Big complex pharma. no it's not just that though because you have the DEA you have the law enforcement end of it and you have the government end of it and if you don't think that legalizing drugs wouldn't put fucking thousands of government workers out of work you know of course it would. The police that they have their own narcotics fucking division. Let, let me let me say one, so, one last thing. You you know why the Soviets invaded Afghanistan? The Soviets invaded Afghanistan because the CIA was using the poppy fields and the heroin and smuggling it into Russia to try to bring down the Soviet Union with drugs. That's why the Soviets went into Afghanistan to burn idiotic. the poppy fields and do all that. And the reason that so, uh, the U.S. It, decided to get into it is because CIA went up to Jimmy Carter and said, "Oh, they're doing, they're stopping this. We need to, we need to get the, the make sure we have the poppies for the drug trade." And that's why they did it. Well, that just means the the Russians at the time were uh, a communist country, and they're idiotic, um, in my opinion. But anyway, we'll take a break, play a couple clips, and when we come back, we'll get into. Uh, more of Ken's uh, stories and what's going on with gold and speaking of the, the CIA Mario Draghi and, and the uh, CIA whatever else uh, is going on in the world of geopolitics so we'll be back right after the not these words just to clarify during the break we play clips and they're usually important clips that have to do with freedom or the subject we're talking about. Usually when Ken's on, I just play general clips because uh, we, you know, this just news based and it's different shit every week. So, but they're usually important or clips that you can learn things from or present a certain point of view based on freedom. So just, I, I, I bring this up, uh every so often but it's not commercials so it's not if you want to walk away while uh i play the clips you can but and it could be a clip you heard already because i do recycle clips because there's a lot of good ones and a lot of important ones but so anyway we'll be right back after this nonpartisan liberty for all dot com end of cash is near. We've covered this before here at PFT, and in a nutshell, it's basically a problem reaction solution analysis. They nationalized the monetary system, which is a huge problem. We reacted by demanding more statism, which perpetuated the problem and now has created the proposed solution, which is a cashless society. But how are they going to justify banning cash? I mean, perhaps the next crash in the business cycle is going to be blamed on hoarding stockpiles of cash. We know the big banks and corporations are sitting on cash reserves. And the social justice 
environmentalist eugenics leftist crowd are likely going to welcome a confiscation of this wealth. In fact, the move to a cashless society is really just one large step towards actual communism. Now, the central banks should not be setting interest rates at ridiculously low levels. It discourages savings and it encourages debt creation. And as we can see in Canada or the U.S. or Japan or Europe, this method of economic growth is really just asset inflation, which leads to recessions and ultimately depression. So their solution is lower interest rates until they're at zero. And then it's negative interest rates. We basically already have that here in Canada. I mean, just ask yourself if your bank or your credit union charges you more each month than you receive an interest. Now, historically, when governments mess around with the economy like this, people respond by hoarding their money. Now, if that money is paper, governments then respond by creating massive inflation and thereby forcing people to spend their money before it becomes completely worthless. Now, it doesn't necessarily quite work like that in our system today, so central banks are now responding by literally eliminating cash. The government wants all cash in the banks, so every transaction can be monitored, regulated, and completely controlled. Imagine the entire world recorded in one giant online ledger, controlled and monitored by a hierarchy of technocrats and self-serving bankers. Eliminating cash may happen after one of the next financial crises. I mean, bailouts have proven to be unpopular, so now there's even talks of bail-ins. We've covered this here before on PFT with Cyprus and the Canadian Connection. You see, a bail-in means that when a bank fails, it will reach into its depositors' accounts before accepting any money from taxpayers. And to keep fiat money in the banking system where the state can get to it, some economists have advocating banning cash. And some countries have already done so. Italy made cash transactions over 1,000 illegal. Switzerland is proposing banning cash payments in excess of 100,000. Russia banned cash transactions over 10,000. Spain banned cash transactions over 2,500. And Mexico made cash payments of more than 200,000 pesos illegal. Uruguay banned cash transactions over 5,000, and France made cash transactions over 1,000 illegal, down from the previous limit of 3,000. Denmark has also made moves towards a cashless society. They're not part of the euro, and they have their own currency called the Krone. And the Danish government is proposing to scrap cash as a cost-saving measure. Even a member of German Council's economic experts is calling for a cashless society. He said it would be a good subject for the agenda of the G7 summit. And as for Canada, we're already well on to that road. An RBS report from 2011 found that the world average for paying by plastic amounted to 40% of transactions. But the rate in Canada was 68%, making us the world leader in people who are voluntarily going cashless. We also don't have a penny anymore, so the precedent has been set to get rid of nickels and quarters. <laughs> and, I mean, how far is this cost-saving measure argument going to reach? I mean, perhaps we better just get rid of all coins and all paper money to stop the drug dealers and the terrorists. The Royal Canadian Mint has actually looked into digital currencies, and although they l later abandoned the project when it became clear that the state is not going to be able to duplicate Bitcoin. In fact, the whole point of the Bitcoin scheme is that it is independent from state involvement. Canada's Interact system is the world leader in digital fiat transaction systems. You can pay by debit card at a cash register or 
pay user fees at a bank machine. In the U.S., these kinds of transaction systems would be owned by the banks, and they usually charge fees on customers or impose cost on retailers. But the not-for-profit Canadian Interact cost so little that it overtook cash as the Canadian standard. A PayPal survey found that 71% of Canadians are ready to go cashless. And an RBC Shoppers Drug Mart poll found that 76% of Canadian women typically carry less than $50 on them compared to 66% of men. And as Wayne Boser, uh, former executive vice president of RBC, says, we are increasingly becoming a cashless society. Canadians are recognizing that debit is a convenient way to pay and Now they can earn reward points on debit purchases that translate into savings. Reward points on debit cards. As in, like, air miles and PC or shopper points. And all those other fake numbers that translate into cheaper groceries or movie theater tickets or whatever. You see, these fake reward points are not savings at all. They're just tokens in a phony economy where goods and services are provided by the corporate state apparatus. As the Canadian Bankers Association works on a unified, standardized system for smartphone payments in Canada, something that is likely going to evolve into a interact for smartphones, analysts are all agreeing that within just a few years, our smartphones are going to be completely merged with our wallets. And I mean... Greater advancements in technology are generally welcomed with open arms. Being able to pay for goods and services with your phone is a temptation that I don't think too many people are going to decline. You know, it's that classic problem-reaction-solution method that we've come to expect from the American elites. Their solution to the stock market crash in the early 2000s was to lower interest rates and thereby creating another problem. And the masses reacted to the bust in 2008 and 9, and the solution provided was more government intervention and even lower interest rates. And now the Fed is stuck at zero and quantitative easing just to keep everything afloat. But... To whom does your life belong? Who owns you? Most people instinctively answer... I own myself, but most people don't actually believe that. What does it mean to own something? It means that you and you alone have the right to decide what is done with that thing. What is yours you can use, you can trade, you can give away, you can destroy. So what does it mean to say you own yourself? It means that you and you alone have the right to decide what is done with your body and your mind, with your time and your energy. If someone else had the right to decide what is done with your body and your mind, your time and your energy, then he would be your owner and you would be his slave. So, are you anyone's slave? Do you pay taxes? Do you feel obligated to obey whatever the politicians decide to call law? Do you imagine that someone else has the right to control you, to rule you? Do you vote? In every political election, you are asked to decide who you want owning you, but owning yourself is never one of the options offered. The only choice you are given is the choice of which politicians will coerce and control you by way of so-called regulation and legislation, and confiscate what you produce by way of taxation. Whoever wins, you will be extorted and dominated. When you vote, whether you win or not, You are accepting that someone else has the right to rule you. You are conceding the state's authority over you. You are agreeing that you are going to be someone's slave, with the only question being which political master will own you. If you believe that you have an obligation to pay taxes, if you concede that it is up to someone else to decide how much of your earnings they will let you keep, then you are their slave. If you own yourself, you don't need the permission of anyone any individual, any group, any collective, any country, any legislature to run your own life, 
make your own choices, and keep the fruits of your own labor. As long as the politicians see you voting, petitioning, protesting, and campaigning, begging for tax cuts, whining for different legislation, as long as they see you timidly obeying whatever commands they issue while begging them to change their so-called laws, then they know that they own you in mind and body. Writing or calling your congressman merely tells him that you still think he's important, that you still view him and his fellow parasites as authority, and that you still think it's his choice whether to let you be free or not. As long as you play their games and legitimize their system, obeying their so-called laws and paying their so-called taxes, acting as if they are your rightful lords and masters, the tyrants know they have nothing to fear. The slave master doesn't mind his slaves pitifully begging for mercy, as long as they keep obeying and keep producing wealth for the master to steal. Those in power aren't worried about elections or petitions. What they do fear is that one day their victims will realize the truth, will stop believing in the divine right of politicians, will stop calling liars and crooks lawmakers, will stop calling the tyrants mercenaries law enforcers, will stop believing that anyone has the right to rule them, will stop imagining authority where there is none, will realize that they own themselves, and will stop bowing to the parasitical, anti-human beast called government. If you own your time and effort, and the fruits of your labor, then stop asking nicely to be allowed to keep it. If you own yourself, then stop asking nicely for legislative permission to run your own life. If you actually believe in unalienable rights, in individual liberty, in freedom, then stop asking nicely for the sociopathic parasites to let you be free. For humanity to be free, people need to stop thinking, talking, and acting like slaves. Stop bowing to megalomaniacs. Stop paying tribute to sociopaths. Stop obeying political parasites. If you truly understand that you own yourself, then start acting like it. The United States houses more human beings in prisons than any other country in the world. This is true whether you're counting total numbers or in relation to population size. This wasn't always the case. The number of prisoners in the U.S. began to rise dramatically in the 1970s. So what changed in America compared to other countries? While there are several competing theories, a look at the data reveals that a significant part of the prison growth in the last 40 years has been driven by the war on drugs. Here's the data. By 1980, there were over 315,000 prisoners in state and federal facilities. 57% were violent offenders. 30% were property violators, such as thieves or those convicted of fraud. 5.5% of inmates were in for public order and other miscellaneous offenses. And the remaining 7.5% were nonviolent drug law violators. Ten years later, the drug war had grown and the total American prison population had more than doubled to over 740,000 inmates. The proportion of offenders in each type of crime had also changed dramatically. The most growth occurred in the nonviolent drug offender population, which grew to a significant 24%. And this last statistic actually understates the influence of the drug war on prison populations. Many studies have shown that drug prohibition causes violent crime by leading to the formation of gangs and cartels. And thus it is safe to say that the number of violent criminals under prohibition is higher than it would otherwise be. From 1990 to 2000, the drug-driven population growth continued. By 2000, the total prison population had almost doubled again to over 1.3 million inmates. And by 2010, the prison population was up to 1.6 million people. The growth has started to settle and even decline in recent years, but the proportions of offenses are retaining their post-1990 levels. America's unique methods of enforcing drug prohibition seem to parallel its unique prison population. And one has to ask, is our country really better off with so many nonviolent drug offenders behind bars? Are drug users likely to be cured from addiction by being locked up? Has locking up dealers and users lessened the demand for drugs? Certainly, the effects on overall usage could not be called a success. 
And yet we spend billions every year on this war and lock up hundreds of thousands. Surely there must be a less costly approach to addressing drug use in America. Nonpartisan liberty for all. Call in at 702-470-7664 or Skype in. Username, nonpartisan liberty for all. Nonpartisan liberty for all. And we are back. Check us out at nonpartisan liberty for all.com. Check out Ken Shorjan at the Daily Economist dot com and at the Ken Shorjan channel on YouTube. Uh, just search for the Daily Economist, or if you listen to the archive of the show or are listening to the archive of the show, you can uh, find the link right in the description there. So we're back uh, with Ken. And so I guess um, there's a whole bunch of stories going on with gold. Uh, We don't have to get into all of them, but we can get into whatever ones that you want to get into and then uh, summarize, I guess, uh, the things that you think are important that are going on. Yeah. uh, To tie off that CIA one. The CIA was interested in the fact that the Swiss were manipulating gold. Uh, the London gold fix at the time had been the you know going on for 70 years. They uh, pretty much had been the keepers of the gold price for you know the past 116, 111 years, something like that. But uh, the CIA uh, was interested in the fact that the Swiss were manipulating gold price back when it was fixed at $35 an ounce. It's kind of funny. The Swiss would uh, trade it during the day, and at the end of the day, it would always end up back at $35 an ounce. But they were using <laughs> it as arbitrage and scalping scalping stuff off there. So that's why the CIA was involved in uh, interest in the gold, gold price. But as we know from WikiLeaks, and I don't know if I remember mentioning this, but WikiLeaks revealed a communique in 1971 where uh, the U.S. was going to create the futures market after they took uh, the dollar off the gold standard as a means to control the price and also using the paper markets to diminish the demand for physical gold by the citizens. And as you can see, you know, since 1971, we're talking 45 years. Very few people in America even know what gold is. They don't really recognize it as money. They couldn't tell you if it was valuable or not. Well, and so ju- they've done ju- it. Just from jewelry, but that's about it. Not, right. Not the coins or bars or anything like that. Ex- bullion, yeah. But the other side of the coin is, is that more Americans have, because they're lazy – they think they own gold by simply investing in the ETFs, and the ETFs aren't backed by anything. Uh, they're just absolute paper. And, you know, so you got futures contracts in gold, and you have the ETFs, and, you know, they're all paper. And that's what Americans think they own gold. They own paper. You need to have the fucking gold in your hand, or it doesn't have to stay in your hand, but in your possession somewhere. Now, there's an interesting thing that's going on that the uh, Treasury Department did, unprecedented event. For the first time, the uh, Treasury Department, which controls the uh, depository guarantor, it's like the FDIC only for pensions, pension guarantee, something like that. The Treasury Department controls that. Well, for the first time, they... That's only for government jobs, right? No, these these are for private like union based pensions oh okay but it has to be if you're part of a union uh yeah or no or any any, pri- any any private any pension because i know like there was a job that i almost took that they had a pension but you weren't part of a union or anything right if it's a private based uh one you know you can have any pension fund that's managed by you know whatever but we're not talking state or municipal ones like calipers in california is is uh public uh the pensions that are controlled by the for federal employees and by the government your pension for working for a state municipality is the state or the city 
okay, this, these are for private. What they, what the Treasury Department did is they allowed for the first time for pension funds to cut benefits. And as we've talked about before, the, the pension, underfunding and pensions across the country are in the trillions of dollars. What do you, you mean with, to cut benefits? That means that it, uh, you know, your Social Security that you're going to get. No, 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 no. Pensions. Pensions. No, no. But I'm saying when you're saying cutting benefits. Right. Are you saying Say, cutting another benefit or what, what do you mean exactly? Ben, benefits. Benefits are what you see. You know, think of proceeds. OK, you work for for uh, a union. You put money out of your paycheck are into you, your pension fund. You're talking they about cutting you, the, the amount that you're getting from your pension. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. That's what they're going to do is cut the states and and, and But you're still going to be putting the same amount in? That's going to be a great question uh, because – Because I'd be fucked up. What ended up happening in, in Dallas when all of a sudden they found out that their pension fund was underfunded by like 40% of what it should be? There was not only a run on people just taking lump sums instead of getting the you know the monthly benefit uh, proceeds. There was a they de- retirees went in and demanded lump sums. A number of police officers who had like twenty years in, they simply just resigned and took a lump sum on their pensions so that they could go work for somebody else, you know, with enough years left that they could get a pension from there, and pretty much destroyed the pension fund. And that's been the fear is because up until now, um, when when you sign a contract to work for, for a state municipality or a union, that contract is, is good by law. They have to do that. Well, now the Treasury Department has said that these private funds can cut benefits. And, uh, you know, the unions that have uh, used the money either to pay politicians for lobbying or for just, you know, got bad managers over their pension funds. Now, a lot of it, too, is is uh, due to the Fed because pensions don't really want to get in the stock markets. It's too volatile. So they, they usually buy municipal bonds. They buy treasury bonds. They buy annuities. They buy real estate investment trust REITs. Well, all that but stuff because, right now, it, you don't make any money off of, right? You make no money because uh, because the interest rates are down at zero. Right. And so, you know, you don't or even get anything. Your negative savings count. in some countries, right? Negative <laughs> in some countries. So when that's been on for a decade, all these pension funds that were putting money into bonds, uh, you know, have can't keep up with the 6 and right. 7% they're, that they're they not need. Because they're not making that off the, the – the return is a lot less now. And the, the other side is that most of these pension funds are the, the managers. They, they're just Wall Street hacks. If they had gotten into gold, when, when interest rates went down to zero, they'd actually be way ahead. If they had gotten into uh, um, a few other things. But, you know, you really can't get into the stock markets. Uh, the volatility is so great because like with your mutual funds, you know, Nearly every, if you if you work for a company and you get into a mutual fund, say you got matching four hundred one k's or whatever, a lot of that is yeah, uh, I have put, that. a lot of that is being put into directly into blue chips. Well, guess what? If if a thousand mutual funds are all owning Apple stock, what happens if the stock goes down? You know, if, or or if 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 suddenly Apple has a bad quarter and the mutual funds want to sell. If you get a thousand mutual funds all selling their blue chip stocks at once, you know you can drive down a stock price by like twenty, thirty percent, which then affects everybody else. I only do so, it because they do fucking matching, so I do the percentage that they do matching because it's it's free money. Uh, I, unfortunately, I would fucking take it out, but I can't. I'll, I'll tell you an interesting uh, thing out there. Have you ever heard of Lending Tree? Yep. They're uh, more. No, 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 no. no. Uh, uh, not company. lending, not lending right. tree. Uh, what is it? Lending. Uh, oh gosh, what is it? I'll think of it as something. Uh, it's a, it, it's a business model sort of like, uh, okay, here it is a peer to peer lending club, lending club. What you can do is, you know, you know how you got GoFundMe's and you've got uh, these type of things that yeah, people where will, people will donate donations. money or yeah, right. this lending club is something similar what you can do is you can put money into it, like say even just twenty five dollars, and 
or say, say you put in a, a hundred dollars, somebody will come up and they'll say they need to borrow money and you can pick and choose which, which borrowers you want to be a part of. And what they'll do is they take a pool of money and they'll only take $25 from you and $25 from say a hundred or a thousand other people. So the most you can lose if somebody defaults on the loan is $25. Yeah. I was going to say that. But do they insure it at all or anything? Well, they don't insure it, but they charge interest on uh, at around 17 to 21%. Here's the thing. The only borrowers that they take are people who have at least a 675 uh, FICO score and uh, f- annual income of $75,000 or more. Well, most of those people aren't going to borrow at that higher percentage, though. No, a lot of them, a lot of them borrow for short term, oh. but they're still going to pay interest. But the fact of the matter is, is uh, there's there's a uh, an investor who decided to try it out before he told the people at his YouTube channel, and he's got what is it sixteen hundred twenty five dollar loans out there, and he's getting a return. He said he said of those sixteen hundred, I've only had five defaults, but he's getting a return of about eleven percent per year. Yeah, that's pretty good. So that's an interesting thing for anybody, you know, listening who wants to do something on the side uh, in investing, you might check out Lending Club. So one of those co-op type things. And uh, so far, the reputation, they really got screwed after the 2008 collapse. And that's when they changed their model to uh, only have people who have, you know, high FICO scores and have an annual income of whatever. Because if you think about it, if you've got a high FICO score, and you got a large income. Chances are well, you, you really get a don't payday screw- loan if you get a high if you get a large income. Yeah, but the the thing about it is, is with a payday loan, um, you know you're going to pay a, a lot higher interest rate, and they are they are brutal. Lending Club will actually work with people if they have to miss a month or something like that. But the point of the matter is, is that if you're part of that and then you're investing in somebody's borrowing. You know, you can choose the amount that you want to put in. So, right. you know, if you lost twenty five dollars because somebody defaulted, well, you know, you're not going to think too much of it, especially if you have, a, if you have sixteen hundred or you know that many loans. How many? How do they decide though who gets their money first? Like, if you're saying that, you know, someone borrows five hundred dollars and a bunch of people put in twenty five, and right. and say they only pay, they don't pay the whole thing back. Well. It would, it, yeah. Well, if they did that, be default, and this company goes through the normal collection channels, so they chase down. Well, no, but that. what I'm saying is, some people would get, like, if they only paid half of it, does the company just keep that money, and then nobody gets no, the, any money back? Your your you know return is based on the interest that's going to pay, and and if once uh, they pay off okay. the loan, you you get your so you don't get nothing back. until after they pay off the loan. Right, but if they're paying monthly payments, then you're going to get a little bit, you know, from from the interest that do. So, so say somebody borrows ten thousand dollars, and there's, uh, you know, forty thousand people that have put twenty five dollars in there, or something like that. Um, the interest on that, you know, may be like ten cents a month that you get, but still, if you have a number of these loans out there over time. Right, it, you're going to cumulatively. Accumul- you're, you're right, gonna, you're right, right. So it, it's just it's not it's not a get rich quick, but it's an investment vehicle that, on average, somebody who's been doing it for a year and a half, uh, they're getting returns of about eleven percent. That's pretty. So, good. I'm not. I'm not a. Uh, I'm not. You know, some people will do these loans too to consolidate credit cards. That's why they'll do these loans too. But I, you know, I'm not. A, I'm not a certified financial planner but you know rather than just talk necessarily about economic things that's something that people can look into if you had like some type of return you know if you had like 10 grand to put out there you know and yeah and and like i said you get to pick and choose which which uh loans uh borrowers you want to be a part of they just don't automatically snag it so you get to pick and choose depending on you know what they're borrowing for what their 
credit score is, what their income is, things like that. You know, do they ha- offer? I'm sure the rates fluctuate too, though. Like if somebody's more high risk, that it's yeah, exactly. a higher uh, interest It'll be a rate. Higher rate, right? But it's going to be more than say the four percent. You know, um, it, it's it's between say four percent and what a credit card rate is. Right. Personal loans always, especially that aren't backed by collateral, those are always going to have higher interest rates. Yeah, I got a, um, what do you call it, a title loan before. That was ridiculous. I yep. paid it off pretty quick, like a month, and I still paid a significant amount of interest. It was insane. Yeah, you you know, if you're going to go to the loan shark, it's a last-ditch you know reason you're going to go. Well, interestingly enough, um, Mario Draghi, the head of the ECB, uh, he was over at Davos, and or actually he had left Davos, but – he wrote an, a letter to uh, you know the Italian banks. We've talked about those. Those are going through some, uh, some hell, uh, solvency problems. Well, after the Italian referendum didn't go through, there's still a lot of talk among, amongst Italian lawmakers about leaving the EU and defaulting on their debts. Well, Mario Draghi sort of dropped a, 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 you know, a bomb – where he said that he implied that a country could leave the Eurozone. In essence, he was saying, yeah, you guys can leave the Eurozone, uh, but uh, first you would need to settle your debts with us, you know, pay back the the ECB. Well, the problem Draghi is, the reason that Draghi is doing this is because, you remember Iceland after the 2008 collapse? Yeah, that they didn't pay, they just threw the banks out of the country and didn't pay them. And they defaulted on their ECB right. loans. And they, they just said, said fuck you. you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what? Every single one of these countries can. Uh, what are but they going to do? Is, go to war Draghi's with them? trying to intimidate them, saying, uh, well, if you leave the Eurozone, you need to pay back your debts or you're going to be screwed. No. They they should just default on them and go make, suddenly make deals with China and Russia <laughs> and, and do that. So anyway, Draghi said this. Well, it's interesting because Draghi said that two days ago. Today, the uh, European Union ombudsman, sort of like an overseer regulator, is suddenly bringing an investigation against Mario Draghi for what he calls conflicts of interest with uh, private banks. So, you know, Draghi has been able to do what he absolutely wanted to do for all this time. Now, all of a sudden, why is he under investigation for having too close a personal relationship with private banks. Well, here's the reason why this is kind of, you know, convoluted and probably I'm thinking it's tied to what he said the other day about the uh EU countries just go ahead and leave. The reason uh I say this is because Mario Draghi was Goldman Sachs and nearly every major banker in Europe is a Goldman Sachs former employee. And Mario Draghi, the reason he became head of the ECB is because when he worked for Goldman Sachs, he had manipulated and cooked the books of Italy because Italy's debt ratio was too high to enter the European Union. So he cooked the books for Italy and so they could get into the EU. And for, he, for that, he was rewarded the head of the ECB. Well, now that uh, Italy is you know, thinking about either leaving the EU, going back to the lira, dumping the euro, defaulting on their debt. Now Draghi is trying to pull in, you know, the chip for saying, hey, we got you in the EU. Uh, You know, you owe me a favor. You need to pay back all your debts. And uh, now the ombudsman is uh, starting to investigate Draghi because his relationships with former Goldman Sachs uh, employees and the private banks may be coming to a close. Is that to say that if uh, they were to leave and not pay those debts, that he would do what? I mean, he's not going to expose anything. himself and say, he yeah, he I cooked their books. But one of the problems is, is that, like I said, he suddenly dropped the, the, the truth bomb that, you know what, you guys can leave the EU. Right, right. But, but don't leave without paying the bit. And that, you know, that's not what the bureaucrats and the – Union want the Europe bureaucrats in the European Union want every country to believe that they're slaves to the Union and they can't ever leave. Right. Well, speaking of Davos, 
Um, one of the big things that they were talking about was the fear of the populist movement. Brexit, Donald Trump, uh, Marine Le Pen in France, the Italian referendum. There's a big fear now of populist revolts and throwing the elites out. So that's what they were talking about in Davos. And so they had this big, all these conferences. Is, what can we do to stop the populist movement? And the head of the IMF, Christine Lagarde, she suggested that the way we can crush the populism um, uprising is we need to give them more welfare, more free stuff. <laughs> nice. Not knowing that right now, as of 2017, eight men, eight of the richest men in the world, have more money than 50% of the entire global population. And they wonder why there's a populist uprising. And, I mean, first of all, that's a ridiculous idea anyway, because the majority of people, I think, uh, well, I don't know if it's the majority anymore because there's awful lot of, an awful lot of people getting welfare but there's a lot of people that uh are working and are not happy with things that aren't getting any help or, or welfare or any you know shit like that yeah well more than more than 50 percent of americans get some form of benefit whether it's social security medicare yeah that's like why i said i don't know if if it's the majority anymore because they give out so much now to such a large percentage. But I would think for a lot of people, it would be fucking taxes. Well, yeah, at least in the U S and hopefully, hopefully uh, we're going to have some tax cuts here pretty quick from the, the new man in charge. But the, the other thing that uh, was spoken at Davos is they have not given up on banning cash. Nobel Prize winning economist Joseph Stiglitz uh, thinks that phasing out currency and moving towards a digital economy would over the long term have benefits that outweigh the costs. To them so, it would, um, not to the average person. Well, exactly. Money is freedom. The ability, you know, we we have we use pretty much a digital system. More of us use our debit and credit cards than we do cash. But we have in the back of our minds that ability that at any time we can go take our cash out of the bank. And the whole purpose behind uh, banning cash is that the, that there'll never be a bank run again, that they can institute negative interest rates. They can tax you on every single transaction. Can take they can your monitor money every transaction. If they feel like it. Exactly. They, they can fucking uh, question Bail every ends. transaction and track it if you're you if they think you're using it for whatever buy drugs or fucking terrorism, which is a tiny percentage of people, but that's how they rationalize it. Um, they're, yeah, they're trying to rationalize this saying, well, um, cash is used by Ill illegal, illegal activities, yeah. by drug cartels and terrorists and whatever. But the fact of the matter is, is you know who does the money laundering? The banks for the cartels and for the terrorists. Yeah, a bunch but of them got, stop got the caught. Then they got fined. They didn't even go to jail. Yeah, go to jail, exactly. Well, by the way, we might as well just throw Bitcoin out the window because uh, – Guess what may be soon going on the blockchain? Uh, you had brought up that bank transactions were going to go on there. The dollar. I don't know if I talked about this. Yeah, weeks. yeah, yeah. Yeah, the dollar is uh, – the SWIFT system is looking to put the dollar on the Yeah, uh, that's what blockchain. you had said. That yeah. By, by the way, uh, Bitcoin is very quickly going to run into some serious uh, credibility problems because you know what the old saying is? If you can't beat them – Yep, join them. So China they're... and the United States are both looking to start Bitcoin ETFs. Like the gold and silver ETF, people can get into Bitcoin by buying paper investments. Not Bitcoin itself, but paper investments. Yeah, the whole point of Bitcoin was to what well, not 100 percent, but a lot of it was you know about uh being anonymous and money right yeah and that too that was the other big thing and that you could 
you know, you could travel from one country to another, not have to declare fucking money, not have to carry, a, you know, them finding out about it, you know, all of that type of uh, stuff. But By now, way, you know why China was suddenly, you know, the, the price rose so much because Chinese were getting into it. You know what the Chinese were using Bitcoin for? Money laundering. To take to because of the capital controls and the cap, fear of capital flight that China had put on the banking system, the Chinese were taking their their yuan, buying Bitcoin and then uh, selling their Bitcoin into dollars. I thought so they, they had could, stopped, uh, and I don't know if it was China, but because I I thought you had said in in China they had stopped them from um, buying Bitcoin or something. No, what they they weren't stopping the transactions of Bitcoin, but what they did was they started, um, they halted the exchanges. Okay. That's what it was. And then. that's part of the problem. Unless you have, you know, two people with Bitcoin and a wallet, say on your smartphone or tablet that can just exchange Bitcoin, you know, right across the thing. Uh, everybody has to go through an exchange if they want to buy their Bitcoins. Right. So that's how they're doing it is they're regulating the, the exchanges. China, I think, eventually wants to go. They want to co-op Bitcoin, put it on the Silk Road. But until you have absolute regulation over that as part of your policy, you know, it's going to be much more difficult. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how they can. They can't totally take it over because there is no way to, as far as I, I know. I mean... They could they could go out and buy it all. I mean, yeah, they could they could use it the same way uh, or buy it the same way everybody else does. If but... you can print endless money and go out to an exchange and buy all the Bitcoin that you can possibly get, you can corner the market. By the way, something else interesting that most most people haven't uh, thought about: how many how many Bitcoin are they going to actually mine? Twenty one million, right? I don't know what the number was, but if According to the you white say paper, twenty one million, million, then that's probably what it is. Uh, right now, they've mined about 15, 15, 16 million at the most. Okay, so they still have a little ways to go. It's going to take a while, like maybe a decade or a couple decades, until it's till it's done because the, the you know they're slowing down the amount of Bitcoin that gets mined. Well, here's the problem: um, all those people that back in two thousand nine, two thousand eight, when they first you know started mining Bitcoin and had Bitcoin and had their wallets. It's now being estimated that 10 to 20 percent of all the Bitcoin is gone forever from people who had wallets and either forgot their pass key, uh, their hard drives crashed. That it's uh, un unaccessible. It's kind of yeah. sitting out there and. Uh... <laughs> yeah, it, it's attached to somebody's wallet and they can't access they their can't, wallet. Yeah, they yeah. And it's gone. It, it, it's gone from use forever. Upwards of that's kind of funny. Ten to twenty percent. So that's so a lot. Even though they may do twenty one million total when Bitcoin is finally mined yeah, out. Yeah, take out. But they may actually only have like fourteen or fifteen million to actually use. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of fucked up. Kind of. Yeah, up. and and see this. That's going to be one of those things that uh, is really really. You know, people didn't take into consideration. There, there was a poor guy in like Norway who had bought Bitcoin when you know bought like ten thousand Bitcoin for a quarter a piece or something like that, and uh, he forgot his pass key and never could get into his wallet. And when Bitcoin got up to a thousand or eleven hundred sixty-five dollars, you know, his Bitcoin was worth uh, eleven million. And he could never <laughs> and access he couldn't it. Act. That's got to be like, I'm surprised he didn't kill himself. Like, yeah, fuck, I got $11 million, but I can't touch it. And then, of course, it went back down uh, later. But well, Let's see what's going on. Uh, the state of Virginia has just taken out of committee, and they're, they're going to vote on this. Uh, House Bill 1668 would facilitate the exemption of taxes – on purchases of gold, silver, and platinum. There's other states that have that too. Exactly, but what this Florida, does, Florida, I believe, does by removing by removing taxes, you change it from being a commodity to being money, right? And you open the door for then the state to start using it as money. Well, I mean, you can, you do, but it's like there's no tax on food neither. 
And, well, there's and, tax on food. Well, there's no tax on unprepared food in certain places. Right. Um, some states, <clears throat> excuse me, New Hampshire doesn't have sales tax, period. So it, what I'm saying is it doesn't necessarily mean that that's, you know what I mean? Like there are states that don't have tax on certain things, or in the case of New Hampshire, they don't have sales tax at all. So it doesn't mean that they consider gold and silver or anything. Uh, they just don't have sales tax. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, let's see what else. Uh, since we're probably close to the end. Yeah. Um, you want to talk about that uh, article I sent you during the break? Uh, yeah, we can talk about that and for, real for quick all and those- then end on that. For all those poor people who were protesting all year for $15 minimum wage, McDonald's has something for you. It is now being distributed, the Big Mac ATM machine. Where you can go up to the machine, put in your money, and it will heat up, put together, and deliver you a Big Mac hamburger. And, of course, they can, you know put anything in there they could put cheeseburgers or b- fucking quarter pounders or whatever but in europe they have pizza machines they've already got the dough pre-done in a in a in a freezer type thing it pushes it out it it heats it a little bit so it's soft then it just these uh mechanisms will put on the sauce the whatever your toppings are and then it'll superheat it and then it'll just pop it out to you from the atm I think I've seen sandwich machines. This is this is what happens when you raise wages above the value that the the worker provides the the service. Right. If they're forced to do fifteen dollar an hour minimum wage, then now they can afford to buy the technology, the robotics that they couldn't before when they were paying people seven eight dollars an hour. Yeah, I think this was inevitable, but they just sped it up is what they did. They they sped up the process because like you're saying, if they know that okay, pretty soon or at some point because some of these uh states or cities have already done it that they're going to have to be paying this much more, they're speeding up the process of automating that job where maybe it would have been around for five more years or something like that. Um but I, I think either way, it's inevitable. But I understand what, what you're saying is they're just taking the money that they would have paid them and saying, you know, fuck that. Let's do this. We're going to have this longer and make more money off it anyway. Or we're going to make more money by, by saving money on employees. Exactly. And the, the first ones are going to be rolled out on January 31st in Boston. Your old stomping grounds. Oh, jeez. Bet they'll uh, love those. Well, they if they put them, uh, geez, downtown and at the where all the colleges are, yep. and yep, you know they had these type of things back in the fifties and sixties. You ever you ever see the old shows where people would uh, go into these like uh, cafes? And you would put coins in the machine, just open the flip and like grab a piece of pie or a sandwich or things like that. One of those uh, food boutiques. I think so. Yeah, I mean, that's what they used to do. And they have just people, you know, putting the prepackaged or pre-cooked stuff. Into yeah, the, well, like, the... like I said, I, I, I've seen sandwich machines recently or machines that had, you know, sandwiches in them that you could... Uh get like a vending machine with sandwiches yeah and and this is not pre-cooked big macs these are cooked to order as you as you as you put in the money yeah so so basically they cut down you know however many people uh because you don't need the people to make it you don't need the people at the register you really just need one guy to refill the machine Pretty much. And and he can service multiple machines. You go on a route, and this is your route, and you go and service multiple machines. And that's just Big Macs. But at some point, you have your whole fucking uh, um, menu in a, in a machine. You know, yep. make it a little bigger or whatever. Or, you know, even at the... Um, 
you can have a little kind of McDonald's and everything's automated and you have you still have the restaurant for people to sit and eat there, but you make it a lot smaller and then you just have instead of where you would see the people standing at uh, registers and the fucking uh, people behind their cooking shit, you see a machine. You have one person that basically just runs that whole part of it and that's it. And then people can sit and eat there or, you know, they could get rid of restaurant, the McDonald's uh, restaurants all together and go 100 percent. Just, you know, you know, another another interesting place that this could show up in, especially in the northeast subways. Down in the subway terminals. Oh, I thought you were talking about subway. The no, not subway sandwich, but down in the yeah. subway terminals where everybody is. Yeah. You know, you you get off work uh, on the subway, or you're getting on, and you're just, you know, it's it's going to be an hour to get home, and you're hungry, and just stop by, grab a Big Mac, eat it on well, the subway gotta, while you're going. Got to be careful where you where you put them, because um, certain areas uh, they might get uh, <laughs> they might get I broken guess. into or <laughs> stolen yeah. or something. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that that's going to be the future, I think, for all fast food. Um, restaurants, of course, are different where, you know, you have these chefs that got to do all this fucking, you know, shit. And maybe later in the future it, you can automate that, but that's not for... Now, can, now you know. the question will be, can you sue the machine if a screw breaks loose and gets in your burger? Yeah, probably not to uh, the McDonald's corporation, but it's right now. I, I know McDonald's is not corporate; it's franchise. So it would probably be McDonald's corporate no, it, that would it, it, would it, do yeah, that. It is corporate, and then they have franchises. Yeah, um, but I'm saying it, it would McDonald's probably be New York Stock Exchange. So you know it's corporate. Yeah, it, but it would probably be. Um, well, what I mean is when I say corporate, I mean because they have uh, food chains where the corporation owns every single fucking uh, restaurant. Whereas right. with McDonald's, yeah, it's a corporation, but it's a corporation with franchises and you pay the franchise fee to McDonald's as opposed to the profits. You know, they charge you whatever or you, you pay a percentage, but usually it's like fr- franchise fee. But it's a um, corporation that has um, franchises. But I'm saying the machines are probably owned by corporate. Yeah, they'd have to because a corporation owns the uh, trademark. Well, no, I mean, as far as same thing, you know, you franchise out the machines and have them pay you whatever. Right. But But they could go more the corporate route and cut out the franchise because i'm sure they would make more money if they were all um you know if they were able to 100 percent corporatize everything and own everything as opposed that'd be to interesting as they get more and more of these you know you just open up uh there in vegas a little place it's got a few slot machines and it's got uh these these food uh food atm yeah i mean they could put them in everywhere basically um That'd be a great question, though, because unless the franchisee has dominion and authority over it, i.e., you know, they're the ones running it out, um, a franchisee would not want one of those machines anywhere near his location because franchisees pay for the right to, you know, have their store. Right. They pay a franchise fee usually. Yeah, covering a number of blocks. But in Las Vegas, I mean, you have it, it. Probably is something like that. That's a good point. But they're they're not that far away. Um, they're kind of all over the place. Although it does seem like McDonald's are further away than other places because when it's corporate, they don't give a fuck. They're just servicing the customer. Sometimes they'll even have stores that don't make money on purpose, just so they you know they want to service the customer because it's all going to the same place. It's corporate as opposed to like what you're talking about. When there's, there's a franchise, they want to be able to, you know, make money themselves, of course, as opposed to the corporation making all the money. So yeah, that's a good point. Like how would that work? 
um, or would they just contract them out to people like they do with vending machines or whatever? Either way, uh, people with who've decided that they didn't want to get their high school diploma, they wanted to drop out. Those who ha- you know don't have any skills, the days of uh, fast food, you know, bartender waitressing. The uh, minimum wage jobs, those are quickly going by the wayside. But waitressing and bartending, at least in Las Vegas, isn't going anywhere for a while um, as far as uh, automation, because especially the waitressing, because that's part of the, you know, at the casinos, they want to see the girls, you know, in little, barely wearing anything, fucking yeah. serving well, them drinks. Yeah, but but fast food places then you know could, fast food's totally different you, you know right and, and and they they probably will but that's the whole point there is that um and this is be my last comment and then if you want to say anything to wrap it up but the the whole point and and i've talked about this before and we may have talked about it either on or off air is that you know fast food jobs and other minimum wage jobs we're not there for uh, people to support their families. They were Bingo. for high school kids, maybe college kids for part-time jobs. Um, or, you know, maybe right out of high school, you're taking a year off or something. Like I took a year off and for a little while I worked at a pizza place. I couldn't stand it. They paid me like four seventy five, but this is back a while ago. And then I got a better job at a liquor store. But, you know, it's it's like a first job or second job kind of thing when you're young. You know, I was 18 years old. So that's the whole point of these jobs. And they don't understand that salary is based off of your skills and what you bring to the table. It, it, any idiot, they they have pictures now, and they've had them for a while. You don't even have to be able to read. I mean, they have pictures of what they want, and you just press the button, and then they tell you the change. I think they may even tell you specifically give 110 and and two quarters. I mean, they've made it that specific. So basically anybody can do it. And that's the whole thing. There's no demand for that. There's no, you don't bring anything to the table. And that's why it's meant as a first job or a part-time job while you're in high school or college because of that, um, uh, purpose. I concur. So, any, anything else, real quick, you want to mention or? Uh, not off the top of my head. Uh, it's going to it, it's going to be interesting. To watch things are going fast and furious. Uh, Dow twenty thousand. Um, you know, analysts are are split amongst is it going to continue to keep going higher, or did they just try to cross it so then they could go ahead and you know crash it from there. Uh, there's two schools of thought. Uh, the the establishment definitely wants the uh, economy to crash under Donald Trump, but does Donald Trump also want it to crash early in his in his um, tenure so he can blame it on Obama? So these are things to watch as we go forward. Um, other than that, well, obviously he also he doesn't want to be a one term. You know, nobody wants to be a one-term president. The last one-term president was fucking uh, George the Bush senior. Uh, older, yeah, and that's yeah. been a while. So you've had what three presidents in a row now that have been uh, two-term presidents. So, and yeah, then bef- and it's going to be a question: Does he really want to? Also, because he's going to be seventy-four when his term is up. Yeah, he might not so. even want to. To be honest, it, it depends right. on what happens because. One thing I think we do agree on is that he has a huge ego and, uh, you know, it depends where he's at with things. Does he, right. you know, if things are left unfinished that he wanted to accomplish, that might push him to say, okay, I'm going to run again because I want to, you know, enhance my legacy. Cause I think the legacy, him being the arrogant guy that he is, I mean, and that whole thing that legacy is it's totally important to him. Right. And and the key thing is too, and I'm absolutely agreeing with you, 
his brand. This is the ultimate, yeah, yeah. you know, final thing on his brand. But he also, because of his ego, and it's like the last chapter of his, his life, kind of. Right. He doesn't want his presidency go down in history as a failure, a failure to the brand. So he's going to definitely right. try his best to, you know, make America better. Is he going to be able to because of just how big the bureaucracy is? Uh, is his policies going to be not very good? That's going to be the question. But I think his intent is going to be to try to do the best he can. Well, you can't do much people. worse than the last. I mean, look at the last two presidents. And that's why, you know, as much as I hate Trump, uh, when I talked about the protest yesterday, and I, and I totally support people's right to protest and free speech, but it was just ridiculous. There's no need for it. They, they they don't even know you're talking about the women's thing. They ha- really, besides, like I said, besides abortion, which I actually agree with, they don't know what the fuck their agenda is because it's all, and that's why I think it's all set up and whatever by the people that are funding it. But I mean, it was just so stupid. It, it right. just, it, there was no, it, if it was something specific that he was going out and he was actually going to pass a bill or did pass a bill and they're protesting, okay, we don't want this bill passed or he just passed this bill. You know, something, not just he got elected today or no. he, he, not even, he, he was already elected. He took office today. So we need to fucking protest. And, th- and then they talked a whole bunch of shit that wasn't really true. And, and, you know, the, the amount of valid points or true points, I mean, were really low um, that they had said. I mean, they're saying he's racist against black people. I, I never heard anything like that. They have a point when it comes to Mexicans and immigrants, but I never heard him say anything bad about black people or gay people or, you know. Well, no, he, be- he believes in gay marriage. He really isn't going to do too much to stop the abortion unless somebody else brings a court case to the Supreme Court. Um, how, and, can, and women, how, anybody, it, how anybody can say he's he's against immigrants when he married two, his first wife and his and his current wife are immigrants. He's against illegal immigrants, is what he's against. Um, well, they may it, that's a the whole other issue though because yeah, they make but, it so hard. To, but whatever. But yeah. But but I mean, at least I can understand. Okay, if people say that, there's. Something, some, um, you know, points to say, well, he, you know, said this or whatever. But, I mean, they they were just, you know, calling him like he's a Nazi and he... They don't even know what those words mean. Uh, like I said, That's he said he hates, that he hates black people. He didn't say anything like that. So, uh, I, I, like I said, I, I don't like him. There are a lot of stupid fucking shit that he said and and whatnot but i think that you know those protests were just ridiculous it was just to push socialism it, it had nothing to even really do with him to be honest they put his name in when they could i mean they brought up uh stuff that had happened obviously before he was even president under obama and it's like it's like they're blaming him for shit that he had nothing to do with when it came to immigration. They, they were asked a lot of women from, from alternative journalists who were out there. They were asking a lot of women, why are you here? We're here because Trump's going to take away our rights. And they, he, they would ask, well, what rights are you taking away? And they couldn't answer. They didn't even know why they were protesting. They just were there to protest. Right. Well, that's because, it's a, like I said, it's an organized thing <clears throat> to push uh, what I saw – of the the w- woman's one, I didn't see as much of that as I did the other one, but it was all socialism. It was it was to push uh, more government. It, it's funny because they want more government control, but they want their person in there. So I would say, yeah, Trump's not my president because I don't believe I I approve of government. I never consented, whatever. But it, I'm consistent. If Hillary was president, I'd say the same thing. I just, when it comes to government, that's what I say. It's not my government. I just happen to fucking live here. I don't approve of it or consent to it. But they're saying he's not my president. But if Hillary was president, she's my president. Obama was my president. You can't have it both ways. You can't sit there and say, well, I like government when the right person's in there. Then I I don't support the system. Because you're full of shit. You support the system. You know, either you support the system or you don't. As Michael Savage says, liberalism is a mental disorder. 
it's I don't know. I, I, I think in a lot of ways it's a fallacy because a lot of these people don't even believe, I think, what they're saying. I think some of them are even hired, to be honest. So uh, who knows? But I, I think it's a whole big thing to push socialism by the elites because, of course, they want socialism for everybody else. They want control of everybody else, but they'll be millionaires at the top that are controlling everything. So, Or communism, whatever. One of those is communism, fascism. Wherever they're in control of everything, you have the oligarchy, and then we all live uh, barely above the poverty line in Agenda 21-type conditions. So There you go. So, all right. Well, that's all for tonight. Uh, thanks again to Ken. Again, uh, DailyEconomist.com and Ken Shorjan on YouTube Mondays and Wednesdays and sometimes Fridays, depending on how Ken is uh, feeling that day. So uh, we will hopefully be back tomorrow. Um, not 100%, but we should be back tomorrow. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I uh, appreciate it. Thanks again to Ken for joining us. Um, always gives us good information and uh, great uh, content and conversations. So, thanks everybody. Listen to what we tell you and just stop. The nation needs to realize that when we tell you to do something, do it. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. If you're right, then the courts will figure it out. We don't get to take the court. But at the end of the day, each and every man is to go home safe. Sometimes the use of force is necessary.